So I picked a psalm about space. Could anyone have predicted that? Anybody? Anyone? Um, I've always <laughs> loved space. I always wanted to be an astronaut. But um, what I knew about being an astronaut was that you had to go up in the vomit comet, you know, in zero gravity. And you got poked and prodded a lot with needles. And you had to wear diapers when you went up in the space shuttle. <laughs> and I was like, I hate vomiting. I hate needles. And I don't want to deal with diapers. So I was like, I think being an astronaut is not for me. And then, of course, years later, becoming a mother, if I had realized that all I was going to do was deal with vomit and needles and diapers, I might have gone ahead and, you know, tried for the astronaut thing. <laughs> but I'm earthbound currently. So um, when I was on my silent retreat, I spent a lot of time sitting outside and just like, looking at the grass and looking at trees and looking at the sky and thinking about how, you know, the sun is emitting all this energy and we're just soaking it up. And I just felt really euphoric, which Sarah pointed out could have been because I was in Colorado and people there sometimes feel euphoric. Um, but, <laughs> but I just kind of felt high on nature, I guess. <laughs> um, has anybody, like, maybe this was just me, but growing up kind of in a fundamentalist background, this was like used as a scientific text, like to prove that the Bible was a, yes. What, what did y'all, what was the message from this text that made it a scientific text? Does anybody remember? No, I think it's something like, that it pours forth speech, the stars pour forth speech, and we realize that stars are emitting radio waves, and it was like, bing, bang, boom. This proves the Bible. Um, unfortunately, it's also in this one that it says that the sun like goes across the sky like a man running a race, and that's absolutely false. The sun does not move across the sky. We move and the sun stays still, right? Um, I want to tell you a story about one man's journey through the stars, um, a Star Trek, if you will. So a long time ago, everybody thought that uh, the earth was the center of the universe, right? Uh, and that made sense because it was steady, it was solid, we could feel it under our feet. Clearly we were not moving, but we could see the sun, and the planets and stars moving. So obviously they were moving. Um, about a hundred years after Jesus was born, there was a mathematician and astronomer who, um, Ryan, can you put my first slide up? Who speculated that what the universe looked like, okay, here, I'll turn this way. That what the universe looked like was the earth in the middle and then things just kind of went around it in these perfect crystal spheres because uh, circles were thought to be the perfect geometric shape. But that didn't really work. And so what they ended up having to do was make it to where, you see how the planets make little circles. So it was like the planets were supposed to make circles around the spheres, but then also make circles as they were making circles around the spheres. And it looks like, like a big, spirograph drawing <laughs> yeah um but they were like this is it this is the perfect way for the universe to be ordered uh and god the god lived out beyond the crystal sphere with the stars and he was the one who was turning the spheres and making everything move um it took about 1500 years for anyone to be like hey maybe that's not how things are <laughs> Um, Nicholas Copernicus was the first person who theorized that the planets moved around the sun, but he was very quickly silenced because that went way against what the church believed and what the political entities believed. But one man happened to pick up on it, and that man was Johann Kepler. Um, I think we can take it off of the slide now. So Kepler was born in 1571. And he was sent to Protestant seminary as a boy because he was going to be like an apologist against the 
encroachment of the Catholic Church and all that kind of stuff. And he spent a lot of his time at seminary feeling unworthy in the eyes of God and confessing of sins and despairing of ever being saved. And this is what Carl Sagan says about him. I read a book by Sagan and I just um, loved how he talked about Kepler. He said, during his time at seminary, God became for Kepler more than a divine wrath craving propitiation. Kepler's God was the creative power of the cosmos. The boy's curiosity about the stars conquered his fear. He wished to learn the eschatology of the world and he dared to contemplate the mind of God. So as Kepler learned more and more about the stars, he embraced the heliocentric model of the universe with the sun at the middle. And it made sense to him because he said, well, God is the center of everything and we revolve around him and the sun is a metaphor for God. So bing, bang, boom, makes perfect sense. <laughs> but he started theorizing about how exactly the planets moved around the sun. Um, because there were lots of people who were making observations and Mars did funny things like seeming to go backwards and like the perfect circle didn't really fit with what anybody saw. So one of Kepler's theories, um, actually, I think he, okay, he graduated from seminary. He goes, instead of being a minister, he becomes a mathematician and an astronomer. And one of his theories about how the planets moved was instead of perfect crystal spheres, they were perfect geometric solids up in the sky, uh, like big polygons, like nested inside of each other. And he was like, this makes perfect sense because I see geometry everywhere. God is in geometry. So therefore there must be these weird shapes in the sky, but that didn't pan out. That was not in fact what was happening. Um, so he kept looking. So throughout Kepler's life, as he kept trying to theorize about exactly how the planets moved around the sun, he faced tons of hardships. He got married, um, he had some kids, they got sick and died. He had some more kids, some of them got sick and died. His wife died. Um, he was exiled two times from where he lived because of the work that he was doing. Uh, he had no money <laughs> because he had to compete with other scientists and nobody wanted to fund any type of research or thought about the sun being the center of the universe because it was very clear that the earth was the center, right? So he had no money, he had no reputation, but he kept working. So eventually uh, he was able to get his hands on some very detailed, solid observational data from another astronomer, Tycho Bray, because uh, Tycho Bray decided to give it to him. And by decided to give it to him, I mean, he was dying. And he said, fine, you can have this, I guess. <laughs> he had not wanted to give it to Kepler before he was dying. So this really helped because Kepler could then like compare um, his theories to data. And also he could look at the data and try to like extrapolate his theories from the data. Um, so he went through a bunch of theories that were similar to the five regular solids idea and nothing fit. And having considered all these options, he was left with what he called only a single cart full of dung, or as we would say, the shittiest option, an ellipse. He was like, it's ugly. It's just a flat squished oval. There's nothing special about it. And it seemed kind of ridiculous, but the ellipse, the imperfect shape matched the data perfectly. So after he figured that out, he really unlocked what he was doing and he started to formulate the three laws of planetary motion. And I wanna share them with you, not um, because we should, I mean, we should all know them. I think you probably all know them anyway, but I've just like gained a lot of spiritual insight from them. So I'm gonna share them with you for that purpose. Hey, Ryan, will you give me the next slide? Okay, oh, go back to the other one. Okay. Okay, so the first law, 
uh, it says that the planets move in ellipse with the sun at one of the focuses of the ellipse. Uh, so Kepler didn't know anything about gravity. So he could just see that the planets were moving, but he didn't know why. So the first law was basically that the planets are always falling towards the sun, but they never fall in. They fall and then they swing around and they go out in this long orbit. So that was the first law. Um, the second law on the second slide, okay, is that uh, if you're like, if you look at a clock face and a clock hand is sweeping out the time, the hand always covers like the same amount of area in the same amount of time. So if you did that on something like this, you would actually, if the, if the planet was just orbiting the same speed, you would actually be covering different areas because of the shape, but because of gravity, again, which Kepler didn't know about, when the planets are close to the sun, they move faster. So they cover the same amount of area in the same amount of time as when they're moving further away, because when they're further away, they slow down. And so whether the planets are close to the sun or far to the sun, they are still somehow um, moving in rhythm with the sun, right? And neither one is better or worse. It's not better for the planet to be closer and it's not better for the planet to be further. It just is, both things are okay. Okay, and then the third law, So there's an equation, we won't talk about the equation. Um, the third law is the law of harmony. And basically, it just says that the further away from the sun a planet is, the slower it moves through every part of its orbit. So Jupiter orbits the sun slower than Earth because it's further away. Um, the only thing that's really important about that, again, is that Kepler didn't know about gravity. So all he thought was the sun is somehow like, drawing the planets to it and he couldn't he didn't know what it was but he knew that there was something about the sun that affected the planets um and he actually thought it was magnetism okay i think i'm done with the slides he thought it was magnetism he thought we were all like giant magnets floating through space but we're not um eventually you know, Isaac Newton discovered that it was gravity, the universal law of gravity. And gravity keeps the planets close to the sun and allows them to swing out, but never to fly away. Okay. And so the irony of everything that Kepler did was how perfect and how harmonious the imperfect shape of the ellipse turned out to be. So Kepler made a lot of errors um, throughout his research based on what he thought he knew or how things should be, you know, like things should be perfect circles because God makes things in perfect circles. But in the end, he didn't see that as time wasted. He saw it as part of a natural rhythm that eventually allowed him to find out the truth. He said, truth is the daughter of time and I am not ashamed to be her midwife. And I love that because I am sometimes ashamed to be <laughs> the midwife <laughs> of time. Uh, I don't like it if it takes me a long time to figure something out. Kepler's work uh, changed the way that we saw ourselves forever. Um, from then on, we knew that we weren't the center of the universe. And that was the first step to everything and the laws of orbital mechanics and gravity and what we know now, that's what still allows us to go to the moon and to send satellites and to do so many things. So that was the beginning of a fabulous journey. But he didn't just want to discover the truth. He wanted to share it with everybody. He actually wrote one of the first pieces of science fiction, which was about a journey to the moon and moon inhabitants. He really got the moon inhabitants part wrong because there's <laughs> no moon inhabitants. <laughs> but he wanted people to be able to imagine what Earth looked like from the outside. So in the end, at the end of his life, he prayed this. I've consummated the work to which I pledged myself using all the abilities that you, God, gave me. 
I have shown the glory of your works to men. But if I have pursued my own glory among men while engaged in a work intended for your glory, be merciful, be compassionate, and forgive. Uh, Carl Sagan's last line about Kepler is that he preferred hard truth to his dearest illusions. So I have a couple of thoughts um, about this. The first one is that um, God, Kepler stopped confessing all of his sins to God and stopped seeing God just as divine wrath when he started to contemplate the mind of God in creation. When he looked at the patterns of the universe, when he looked at what God does on a vast and an almost eternal scale. Um, Sometimes I'm really preoccupied with what's going on right in front of me. And I'm really invested in seeing God do something right in front of me. And I forget that all around me all the time are these miraculous processes that are keeping me from, you know, flying off into space or crashing into the sun and burning up. And um, just that even when I'm like, oh God, you're not at work. <laughs> you're not doing anything. Uh, really, he is all the time, all the time. Um, and that I can see um, more of the truth of God when I lift up my eyes than when I look down at myself. Um, my other thought is that Kepler had to let go of his own idea of God's perfection to see God's actual perfection. Um, gravity is a freaking miracle. Uh, the elliptical orbits of the way that we move is just this vast cosmic dance, which is probably way better than perfect crystal spheres. Um, but if Kepler had kept holding on to that idea, we you know, we would not have found the, the cart full of dung idea, the squishy ellipse. Uh, and then the last thing I wonder is if the motion of our lives is like the motion of the planets where we're always falling towards God, but we're never crashing into him. We fall forward and we move away, but even when we're moving away, we're never in danger of flying off away from God. I think there are times when we and people we love seem out of control and far from God. And I wonder if even then we're being moved by a force that's going to bring us back to be closer to God again. Um, I just want to open up the floor. Thoughts, reactions, what's going through your mind at this point? Hi. Well, okay, so I'm in astronomy right now. <laughs> um, and so all that you're talking about, I'm like, yeah, wait a minute, I know that. Um, but something that is going through my mind right now is how far we've come um, in our information about space and how like, Hopefully we're launching the James Webb telescope soon, which is a hundred times stronger than Hubble. Yeah. Um, and like just thinking about that and how far we've come in just our advances and understanding like the universe can just like, and like, I feel like religion has been the same for a long time. And, mm -hmm. and so seeing that there can be that change because humans just get fixed mindsets and they just, they know what's right and it is right. Like there's, there's no room for error, there's, it's right. And so just the fact of how we learn from our mistakes and from our misunderstandings of what space looks like and that we fix that and that we know so much more yeah. and that 
we also reflect that into like who God is and um, how God works and our relationship with God. Yeah, that's like, there were a lot of people who, there were several people who probably could have, you know, really popularized the heliocentric model of the universe, but like Kepler really like, yeah, I think one of the things he said was like, if this is how it is, I guess I should accept how God made things with a grateful mind. Like, that's what he said. You know, he's like, I, this is not how I think things should be, but this is the truth and I'm going to accept it. And like, just how much that unlocked for him. Right. And I, that's the exact same thing I thought about the church. And I'm like, what are our dearest illusions? What are we holding on to that? If we let go, it would unlock something. I mean, yeah. 100%. Uh, sorry, that's homework. <laughs> Go home, think about your dearest illusions. Okay. Yeah, uh, I really liked that idea um, of, you know, orbiting around God, feeling closer and more distant. Um, like, and how safe that feels that when you're on that far side of the orbit, you think you're going to float off into space, but don't worry, actually, you're going to come back around because reality is reality, like whether you know it or not, you know? And I was like, oh, well, that's nice. I like that. The last Reese turn to talk. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, two things stick out to me sort of connected to Izzy's thinking about how much how far we've come and how much we know and yet the vastest vastness of what we don't know is overwhelming like it doesn't even compare and it is in the unknowing that we discover new stuff and that it's in the curiosity and the reality that I don't have everything figured out that allows the potential of something new to pop up. And so thinking of both the experience of science and the experience of God, that it's in the unknowing and the curiosity towards that unknowing uh, that something new opens up. And then secondly, thinking about how much happens in empty space, like even down to the atoms, they're so vast, but there's so much going on. And even when it looks like there's nothing, there's always something happening. Uh, and to me, that's really hopeful and connected to Jen's, like even when we're far away, when it's darkest, there's still stuff happening um, that we can't quite put our finger on. I don't know, that to me gives me a lot of hope and um, ironically security uh, in the unknowing. Yeah, Ben, as you were talking, I was thinking, I, I think I've heard, somebody say that uh, for, for all that we know, 95% uh, of the universe is still dark matter to us. It is mystery. And uh, to your point, I mean, it, it creates a sense of curiosity. I think another virtue that's really important um, that comes from that is just humility, that we see ourselves rightly in that, that what we know we hold loosely because, wow, look how much it's changed in the last 500 years. Um, and also, look how small of a sliver we see in our finite existence. Uh, it just makes me, uh, yeah, it, it, it humbles me, makes me want to be open to... Uh, my illusions being poked at because wow, I'm this is really big. Another thing, <laughs> um, but well, something I'm just thinking about right now is the fact that when Copernicus first like was like, hey, maybe maybe the sun is the center, like everyone else was like no you're stupid like why why would the sun be the center like 
we are the center of everything. We are. Martin Luther was like, ah, oh, check out this idiot. Like he, he was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, and I think it's crazy the power that the majority has. Um, and I feel like, like Copernicus doesn't know that he was right. You know, like, <laughs> You know, in his life, he's like, well, I guess I was stupid. I, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> why would why would I think that? And then just to come to find out that 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 is the identity of of our solar system, and like just the fact of how big a part the majority can play, um, and especially like in the church, like the majority has the power. Like you know if the like the, the top of the top is what tells everyone oh this is how it goes like this is how you should interpret the bible this is how you should take these words that jesus said this is how you should take the words that god said and then when you step out of that line most of the time it's kind of a oh you're stupid like why why would you think that that's what that meant um and just when when we open ourselves up to that place of unknowing, um, just the opportunity of how we could see God and how, how our relationship with God could change. Um, because also I feel like now, at least in, in, in what I interpret of God is that, or what I, I, I don't want God to be a harsh God that punishes people and strikes people down on the spot for sinning. Like, and just the idea of where we've grown from that place of God is a God that you fear to like God being a, a friend, a family, a, a supporter and rather, yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> Next one. Yeah, no. I, I feel like you should get up and talk. I mean, because there's all kinds of we could talk about gravity, we could talk about all kinds of things. Izzy, get up here and just tell us all the things. Um, that's what I loved about Kepler like writing the first science fiction, writing some of the first science fiction. So he was like, people need to believe this, like, not just me who's like. And just like the power of stories, you know, the stories we tell ourselves about Jesus, the stories we tell ourselves about the church, they have um, so much power. And we should tell good stories. The moon, he was wrong about oh, yeah. some parts of that, but he was onto something. Like there, there's something noble about him having the courage to Im imagine into the unknowing. Yeah. Like that is so hopeful to me. At the time when everyone thought that like, like to imagine into, like to us, it's like, ah, you know, well, that's how, that's how all of our stuff is now. Everybody goes to the moon. But at the time, nobody went to the moon and nobody looked back and saw the earth as a planet. So to imagine that was, yeah. <laughs> I I found like your your <laughs> well okay well just thinking about the moon um the moon comparatively is the biggest. Um, it's a quarter the size of the earth, which is one of the biggest moons um, of any known moons in our solar system. Um, and yeah, so the moon is a quarter the size of earth, which is really big. Like, like that's, that's big. And so just thinking about like comparing the, like revolution of the sun and how how we do that like the ellipses and how we are pulling away from god but we're always going to be pulled back of like thinking about the moon of like your your support system your your family because 
even no matter how far away we are from the sun, the moon is reflecting the sun. The way that we see the moon is the sun's light. And so thinking about the moon as the people that are that we surround ourselves with and just how we see God in our everyday lives, even if we're not necessarily close to God at the time. Look at you go, man. Love it. That was great. Oh, uh, thank you. Right side of the room <laughs> and left side of the room. <laughs> and um and zoom people <laughs> um i like knowing all of this uh like we're, our series is about praying the psalms and knowing all of this i feel i personally <laughs> uh wanted to share this with you because knowing all of these things makes me feel more equipped to pray this psalm in spirit and in truth um, this is what, well, this is another thing that Kepler said. Kepler is just amazing. Apparently, uh, he called the, um, orbits of the planets, a symphony of voices. And he said within this symphony of voices, man can taste in small measure, the delight of God, the supreme artist. I yield freely to the sacred frenzy. Um, I wonder for me, if instead of being part of a world of chaos or a world that's perfect, I wonder if I am part of a sacred frenzy created by the Supreme artist. Um, and that just gives me shivers. Um, we all pray this Psalm with me. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, and yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Oh God, we are in awe of you. Help us to find our place in your beautiful creation, amen.